is actually going to throw this up uh, on YouTube at the same time. So I'm just waiting for it to just pull across here. One, two, three. Well, hello again. Welcome back to the Jason and Peely Project. Super excited for today's show on multifamily foundation. We have a great guest, Jerome Myers on the show. Hey, Jerome, how you doing? Awesome, Jason. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. I was just on Jerome's show. It's super awesome. Can't wait for that to launch. And so Jerome, a little bit about Jerome. He's got a really thing that hits home with me. He likes to actually operate the buildings, which is a huge part for there. He's the Myers Development Group LLC focuses on buying broken apartment building businesses and using innovative thinking and solid execution strategies to optimize the operational efficiency of the business. That's a lot of words there. I'm, I'm happy I got across. So from that point, everything else can go very well because I've gotten through that. Uh, Mr. Myers is asset management for approximately 90 units and 90,000 square feet of workforce housing across Virginia and North Carolina and is on a mission to hold a thousand doors by the end of 2028. Wow. So Jerome, welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for being on. Man, I'm so excited to be here. You know, I've heard so much about, you get the urban legends of the different operators around the country and your name comes up all the time. And so to get the opportunity to share with you today is just amazing, Jason. Thank well, uh -oh. well let, let's see what we can do to really put this value out there because I'm really excited to learn more about you. And let's talk. So 90 doors, 90,000 square feet, Talk to me about that. You know, where does where did this start? And we'll we'll start really with the idea of doing this and the implementation. Yeah. So the idea started. It was conceived on the stoop of an apartment building while we were in college. Me and one of my best friends, Duran, were sitting out and doing math like engineering students always do in their free time, right? And started counting. It's like I paid three ninety five. My two roommates paid three ninety five. You pay 395, you've got two roommates that pay 395, and then we multiplied it around the complex. The guy was making $700,000 a year. And we never talked to him. We never saw him. We were like, this is a great lifestyle. And, you know, I was doing some soul searching at that point. I knew that I didn't really want to be a career engineer, but yeah, we were going through it and I was on scholarship. So, you know, we finished that and went off into corporate America but I never forgot about trying to decouple my time from money. And so, you know, we got some experience, saved some money. Um, and then I, I started investing in real estate through hard money lending. I was lending to fix and flippers. And then there came a point where, you know, the corporate um, career was going well. Um, we built a huge division, at least huge by my standards. So we went from, I was employee number two, by August we were up to 175 employees. We built 20 million in revenue that year. And then when I got to the end of the year on Christmas Eve, I'm arguing with my supervisor because like, yeah, we need to lay off about 50% of the workforce. I'm like what? Like we just had an amazing, we were super profitable, 30% profit margin. And so he's like, Jerome, you can do it or somebody else can, but you should do it because you have to go forward and continue to build the business. Fast forward to Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving break, the next year, same thing. Wow. That day I became a corporate America dropout. I finished out the year to, um, you know, kind of unravel everything, but I was done. I, I didn't have the stomach for laying folks off. And so I got back to what I decided I wanted to do in college, which was be a real estate investor. Started knocking on doors at banks thinking I was going to buy a property. That didn't work out. Um, I think I went to 10 different banks. All banks said no. I said, well, you know, I got an MBA. I got a project management professional certification. I got all these things. Like, yeah, but you've never signed on a loan for a investment of similar size. And that's when the reality hit for me that, hey, you know, if you want to be an operator, you've got to get into the space. And, you know, the only way that you really signify that to the bank is by signing on a loan. Uh, but my struggle is this, Jason. I, or was this, I am the son of a soldier and a stay-at-home mom. And so we didn't have attorneys and doctors and business owners coming over to the house for dinner. Uh, we didn't discuss entrepreneurship around the kitchen table. Yeah. It was great for me to go to college and get a good job and then work that job for 40 years and retire. And, you know, that was the path that was set for me because that's what my parents knew. Well, let's not leave that point for a sec. What was that? Because there's a lot of people that are in that state right now, potentially doing a job where they're not fulfilled or they're not liking that message of what they have to put out, just like you having to lay off people at a time like, like holidays. Right. And you said enough. And you had it. What was the family reaction? Because and there's a family reaction then, and now the family reaction now. Seeing what you're doing, so talk to talk us through this about their their initial response. 
Yeah, I mean, initially my dad, he always wanted to be an entrepreneur and he doesn't say much unless he knows I'm going to run into a brick wall. He just kind of shrugged his shoulders and shook his head. Hmm. Uh, Mom was like, well, how are you going to pay for insurance? How are you going to do this? You got two kids. And at the time I was married, like you, you got all these things. Like, what are you going to do with all the life that you built? And I, I'm starting over. I'm building a new life, one on my own path and my own accord. Um, if I could build a $20 million business for a company, then I, I don't have to build 20 million, but I suspect I can build something pretty reasonable for myself. Yeah. And, you know, it may be uncomfortable at the start, but at the end of the day, I think I'll be able to work my way through it and eventually, you know, have a very comfortable life. And what I didn't realize going into it is the freedom piece of it, the control of what you do and how you do it um, is worth more than money. And yeah. I didn't realize that until after the fact, I think too often we put um, too much value on money and not enough value on being able to allocate our time the way we want to. And for me, that's been the greatest shift for me. Yeah. And it looks like you had great parents who really, you know, dad, he's going to keep you from, you know, jumping off, you know, the cliff. If he sees you going in the wrong direction, a mom was practical. She just laid it out. Like, how are you going to pay for insurance? Hanging, point it. But you're an engineer and you had that, had that in you. So you were probably already pushing the numbers to your head and you took action and you believed in yourself, which is, you know, a lot of people listening here, they, that's the one thing that's missing right now is you, you have to start with the belief, right? And the belief's got to come with you first. And when you set yourself up to, you know, worry about what everybody else is thinking, well, not everybody else is really thinking about you. They're so busy worrying about themselves, right? And so you get out there, you start taking action and you get out there and you, you get told flatly no, right? And it's the, it's the persistence to get to that yes, that's where the winning is, right? So if we had this conversation today and you said, hey, you just got to get to the 11th bank to hear a yes, well, you crush those first 10 banks pretty quickly just to get through them because you know that one's coming, right? But so you do that point, you do these, you do these steps, you, you, where do you find the experience piece or the, um, the piece that starts filling in the gap to get you moving with the forward momentum? Yeah, I mean, so I, I didn't go to number 11 again because it was kind of insane to keep doing the same thing over and over again. So I pivoted and started fixing and flipping houses. And awesome. it was fixing and flipping houses that I was, I found my answer to solving the experience problem. You know, multifamily for all intents and purposes is a good old boys club. It's a frat or a sorority, depending on, you know, who's bringing you in. Somebody's got to vouch for you and say, hey, we want this person in the game. And so I was sitting on the stoop, an investor came up, said, let me check out your finishes. We're getting ready to do a property down the street. I was like, oh yeah, cool. And so he starts talking and then he mentions, I want to put an offer in on a building that uh, is in Churchill, which is a, a little suburb of Richmond, Virginia. And we started going through the conversation. It's like, man, I tried to buy that four or five months ago, but I wasn't able to get any bank financing. He's like, well, I'm getting ready to put an offer in on it. We've already oh. bought one. And, you know, he had a partner that was kind of silent who had a really big balance sheet and they had experience from the property they already built. Well, he submitted an offer, didn't work out. But before he submitted that offer, I asked him, I was like, hey, man, bring me in. Let me participate in the project. I've been trying to get into the space. And they said the experience partner was what was missing. But the guy didn't need me. Yeah. And his only question was, well, how much money are you bring to the table? And I was like, man, we could figure something out. Just bring me into the process and then we'll work through that. Uh, and so long story short, I got back into the deal with that guy and a few other folks because he asked somebody to be a general contractor and he and I have been working together. And so, you know, the three amigos were going to go buy it. Then we added a couple other folks into the mix, property manager, and actually the broker put his commission back into the deal. And so the five of us tucked down this 23 unit, which was a super heavy value I had play for us. And, you know, we, we were able to take rents from 695 to 1195 on that property. And so, you know, that was the start of it all. Yeah. And, you, and the through line here, right? We should just label this, I'm going to figure it out, right? Because that, that's basically the thing, really. Because you, you get told no, or what are you going to do? And instead of just running and saying, okay, I can't do it, which is usually a lot of people's reaction said, we're going to figure it out. Okay, I can't get a loan. I'll go fix and flip. Okay, someone comes up and wants that building. I'm going to ask how I can get involved. They ask someone to bring money. We're going to figure it out. And we're going to keep that. Keep pushing the point here to find ways that you can bring value. I mean, that's absolutely huge. So you talk about this property, 23 units, you go in there, 695 rents turns into 1195 rents. That's a lot. That's a big turn, right? So that, that's a heavy value. Add. What were some of the major lessons learned going forward when, when that 
potentially th- there were great learning lessons, but it would have been, been nice to know that experience before getting into it. You know, it's kind of the gift and the curse, right? So I got into the partnership and got my experience, but the fact of the matter is in hindsight, that's probably not the, wasn't the right partnership for me, right? You want to do a value alignment assessment before you jump into any partnership. The other piece of that is you probably want to have some time observing the people that you're going to work with in your partnership before you participate in a partnership with them. And I had neither one of those. Um, We jumped in, everybody was sitting at the table and through our due diligence meetings, we got to know each other, but it's pretty easy to, um, you know, hide your true intentions or who you are and what's most important to you, or that you're only out for yourself in a long meeting, right? Um, And so, you know, we learned a ton about who each other was when we actually got into the project because, you know, things go wrong as they always will. And when things go wrong, people really begin to show their true colors. And so, you know, I've done four or five other projects since that one with people that I've known a really long time. And the atmosphere and the environment is very, very different in those partnerships than in this one. Yeah. And for you, kudos for getting in the deal. Right. But and that's a great part about partnerships is that there's a lot of things you want to know. One is make sure you're even in alignment, like you said, and two, making sure that you're not both doing the same roles. So you're 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 disqualifying yourselves because, you know, maybe both is strong at asset management. and There's nobody to raise funds or whatever. So it it is it's hard, and especially like say it's a family partnership to have those talks up front. But you have to because it saves you on the back end. And, um, you know, I've been in uh, bad partnerships years ago. And, you know, one was really just one that, that was with a friend. And honestly, we didn't have the right talks up front and it soured the relationship, you know, and, and that's, it's unfortunate. Um, but it's a lesson learned, right. You know, and it's, it was, it's a lesson learned that it's better to keep the friendship and keep the uh, community than, than to ruin it over, over business. And the same part going is that you do want to make sure that there's clear, clear alignment because, you know, it, I felt like I was working more than well, I was, but it wasn't, we never had that talk track before. So maybe the expectations was, I wasn't clear in what, what my expectation of that other person was. Um, and it goes a lot with hiring too, is that, you know, if you're not clear with your employees, they may think they're doing a bang up job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then on that point, but they're not, and you, but you haven't been clear what you're expecting from them. So they, they don't know where the, the threshold is, right? They don't know, and they don't want to step on toes. So super great lessons there. So you, you go with that 23 unit, you move it to other properties now. Um, talk to us about some of the strategies you use really from an operation standpoint. Um, yeah, we'll say particularly, you, you could talk about now for COVID, um, you know, this is going to pass, but let's talk about it. Like, what are some of the things that you've been using in your buildings to really facilitate making these better places to live and really fixing, as you said, broken apartment buildings? Yeah, I mean, our our approach isn't much different in the COVID environment than it was prior to, right? The goal is to improve the operations of the property. And there's a number of different ways to do that, right? There's an income improvement by either charging more rent and getting higher quality residents in the building or reducing vacancy. And so maybe you're doing some form of concession but get in the building occupied. Um, on the operational side, you know, we, we're we still making strategic investments in the properties. Some folks have pulled all the way back and they're just gonna wait and see. Um, you know, we had some, we have vendors that are counting on us as operators to continue to operate our business. And while, you know, it's uncomfortable to still, you know, deploy capital into the business, the fact of the matter is, you know, we wanna do what we can to keep the economy going. I think a lot of people have just decided, hey, if a person's on payroll, we'll keep them busy. But you know, because of the way that we've structured our business, uh, we don't have internal employees. Everybody's at some form of a 1099 contractor, including our property manager. And so, with all of those parts and pieces coming together, you know, our team we, we've got to keep them rolling because if not, and they close up shop. You know, what are we going to do on the back end? How are we going to be able to operate our business when this storm passes? Because it's inevitable that it's going to pass. And the other thing that I've been saying pretty regularly across the conversations I've had about this is, where's the demand for housing going to go? Like everybody's talking about the market's going to get soft, but where's it going to go? And so the best answer I've heard in response to that is, well, can they pay rent? I mean, there's going to be at some point where people decide that, you know, killing the economy isn't more important than uh, a small group of the uh, 
um, population being at risk of getting sick. And you know, with that said, that small group of the population can stay at home. They can self quarantine until you know they're the factors of them getting sick and potentially dying, you know, dissipate. Um, and, you know, I would hate to be the president or anybody in Congress at this point, because, you know, there's opposing views on what should happen and how it should happen. But, you know, from our perspective, controlling what we can control, you know, we're making the strategic investments that we can that actually make sense, um, that make the property look better. For instance, we had a vendor come out and power wash their property for one of our newer buildings from last fall, because I mean, we're in the process of, you know, still repositioning that. And when people pull up, we want them to see a nice shiny building. I mean, I yeah. think that makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, we're not going into people's units right now and doing stuff outside of what absolutely has to be done from an emergency standpoint. Um, but, you know, if somebody's working in a unit doing a rehab or, you know, there's some exterior things that need to be done. We want to keep folks working because the fact of the matter is our business is going to keep going and I just don't see people not needing a place to live. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And you, you said some really smart things there. And so one thing that really take into account is that most areas and I'm assuming yours too are, are at a discount in, in the amount of housing that's available and the number of people that want it. Right. So I, I could see negative rent growth happening shortly compared to not, you know, being 50% vacant because where are these people going to go? You know, they may be able to pay less, but where are we going to put them? We're going to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people living under a bridge. How are they unlikely? You know, they're still going to have some income, but maybe they're going to be at a discount for a couple months as they find their new way. Um, and these investments, yeah, if you just, if your immediate reaction, like you said before, and this goes back to your, your days in corporate, it was just fire everybody. And what's that message you're sending to your apartment building, right? What's the message that you're sending to those people that are working for you when you say, okay, it's time to come back to work. They're like, well, you know, Jerome cut me loose, you know, the second something might have been hard, you know, and so what's the message you're sending there? And so to keep the keep them on, keep them working, you know, you, you're making a business decision, but you're also setting setting the tone for how business is going to run and how you're going to get them push forward. And you, you do want this to be a great place to live and people will respect that, you know, and they'll, they'll choose to, to stay there instead of cutting you loose. You're saying, well, Jerome's trying to make this a better place for me to live. And I, and, he, and we see that because he's taking care of the place instead of, you know, locking everything down and you're making, you know, the picks that are really viable for the property. So, I mean, that's awesome. So what's, what is your take on, on going forward right now? Are you still, got, are you still surveying for new investments, new opportunities, or are you waiting for the landscape to shake out a little bit with, with your approach right now? Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm overly optimistic because I've got stuff that we're getting ready to refinance and potentially put on the market, but and I don't see a huge discount coming in the immediate future on properties. And so, you know, if something made sense to buy two months ago, it probably still makes sense to buy right now. The issue that we're having in our business is the wealthier folks that we rely on to participate in the purchase are not comfortable entering into new agreements right now. And so they've pulled back and they're waiting to see how things shake out. And of course, you know, that's a hindrance on our business. Um, you know, we've got a ton of capital deployed across the projects that we own. And so we're relying on other people to make good on the promises that we're making to brokers and sellers. And so, you know, I've got to know with the great degree of certainty that whoever we're partnering with to take down these deals and then fix them to harness the or capture the equity from the appreciation and the property's value, uh, they've got to have my back. And, you know, as we grow the network, you know, back to that experience that I had early on, you know, I'm hesitant to partner with certain folks and I'm really particular about who I bring into the space because, you know, if we're all in the same boat and the boat that springs a leak, mm. know that everybody's willing to grab a bucket yeah. and you don't really know that it all sounds good until it's actually time to write the check. And it's just <laughs> with investing, right? Anybody who's raised money for a deal has had somebody commit to being in a deal and then they not write the check for you. And that gets really painful, especially when you need to cover the gap or, you know, they had a large allocation and then they pull back. Um, some people raise double the money and, you know, that really hasn't been our approach because we tried to surround ourselves with folks who are of their word. Yeah. Um, you know, in situations more often than we like, we've experienced folks who kind of just backed out on us and punted and disappeared like ghosts, which, you know, is uncomfortable. And so, you know, as I'm making these promises, because I really believe the only thing that I have is my name, um, I'm being really particular about who I extend my 
worried to knowing that if other people don't follow through on theirs, I can't perform. You know, it's, they say time fixes all, but I think timeline will fix all. I think if we get some clarity on when things are allowed to resume in some capacity, they, people will be more optimistic because everybody has this uncertainty here. Okay, I may get a stimulus check. I, you know, I, I'm a renter. I may get a stimulus check, right? But I have no idea when I'm going back to work. I would be fearful that how far will the stimulus check take me? Because I don't know if I'm going back in two weeks, six weeks. But if they get the stimulus check and here yeah, they're going back May 15th, you know that that would carry weight from a you know from every standpoint from them wanting to pay mail, uh, rent in May and others. So that that's going to have some clarity once we get a timeline. Um, but I agree, investors are are making sure they're making wise decisions. And I, I know with you, you you guys are making strong investments. So I'm sure you guys will have the clarity to really push forward. And I agree. There's a, a ton of opportunity out there. You, you just, we just now have to take in new things, right? The, um, the loan parameter is going to be a little bit different. The, uh, the opportunities that that come across are going to change slightly. Um, a deal still may be a good deal, but now if you have to bring in an extra 20, 25% of money for reserves, what does that do to returns? What's that going to do to not only your expectations for the property, your timeline for the property, your, your investors' expectations, right? All that has to be really clarified. And could some of this back off with with uh, lenders once there's a little more certainty in the market? Sure. But right now, I mean, we work with what we work with, right? Because here we figure it out as we know, right? And just like you do, you keep figuring it out. So Jerome, super great, man. I, I love your story. I love what you're doing. Uh, tell me about your podcast, uh, when it's launching, when it's out, best place for people to reach out for you to talk more. And uh, yeah, give us that. Yeah, man. I appreciate the opportunity to chat about that a little bit. So the podcast is Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. And, you know, we wanted to get rid of the HGTV fairy tale story of apartment ownership. Um, you're running a- What? What? It's not all perfect? Look, man, we're, we're running businesses and anybody who's run a business knows that stuff is the fan. And you've got to be willing to be agile and you know, adjust and make decisions on the fly. And, you know, what we've found, what I found, I, I listen to a ton of podcasts, probably 40 hours a week. And what I found is everybody's well polished. They've got their pitch and they go in, they sell, give their pitch and tell everybody to come to them and that this is the greatest thing in the world. And then it's not until people actually get into the deal, they realize that they've been sold a bill of goods. And when things don't go well, um, you know, they're surprised. And so what we wanted to do was give people an inside look and get real life lessons from real operators. And so Jason was one of those folks when I put, put up a post on LinkedIn and, you know, for the folks who want to catch out with me, LinkedIn is probably the best place to connect with me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Jerome Myers, last name is M-Y-E-R-S. Uh, but they tagged Jason. It's like, Jason's one of those guys who's been through it and he's got a great episode we talk about people shooting at uh, next door to his building we talk about uh, electric wires breaking and busting in the middle of the night like there's just so many cool stories and you know we've talked to over 30 operators at this point right and uh, we launched the first episode the last day of march and awesome. we've just had another one go live. So they come out at noon on Tuesdays on all major podcasting platforms. We also have the videos up on YouTube for anybody who's interested in checking those out. Mm -hmm. And the goal is just to give people a look behind the curtain before they get into this business, whether they're operators or uh, just investing as a limited partner. Yeah. And that's just the whole game, man. We want, we want the collective, not just people who want to get into the space, but the collective genius of operators, I, there's no reason I should make the same mistake Jason made, right? And there's no reason Jason should make the same mistake I made. And there hasn't been a forum for that. And so that's what we're trying to do, man. We're trying to contribute to the collective genius of multifamily operators. I love it, man. Well, Jerome, thanks so much for being on the show. Super appreciate your time. Yeah, man, this was awesome. Thanks for the opportunity. You got it, man. Well, everybody listening, thanks so much for, of course, checking us out. If you like what you hear, go down, hit that subscribe button. Make sure to give us a ratings and review. It doesn't have to be five stars. I'll show and you know this episode was. But if you don't, not happy with Jason, tell me why. Tell me what I can do better. We want to keep bringing you value. Again, thanks so much for checking us out. We'll talk to you soon.